All right, Ivor, we're live on video. Stand by for audio. All right, good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel podcast show. So today, I'm recording on a beautiful Saturday here in Pennsylvania, USA, but I'm uh, tapping in over the pond. Uh, we're bringing on another new guest co-host for you, ladies and gentlemen. And this gentleman, I think, is, what we'll to figure this one out, I think five to six hours ahead of us. Uh, he's well connected with some of our other past guest co-hosts because this man understands a little bit about healthy fats. There's your little lead in there. Uh, and he's recently been working on a project that I've been helping out with with another past guest co-host by the name of Vinny Tortorich. And that's right, the crowdfunded, Indiegogo funded project, the Fat Documentary. So shout out for them. Uh, but more importantly, this gentleman's been doing a lot of a lot of blogging, a, a lot of exposure out there for what is the truth behind healthy fats longer than this project ever existed. And uh, his brand is known as the fatemperor.com. So without further ado, welcome to the show, sir, Ivor Cummins. Hey, thanks a lot, Scott. Great stuff. What time is it over there? Are you five hours ahead of me? Yeah, five hours ahead of Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, and, and which country are you actually hailing from, just to be clear? Oh, I'm in Dublin, the capital of Ireland. Uh, <laughs> there's my family crest hanging behind me. So, my oh, is, right. Very my good. Name is, my name is Scott William Mulvaney. Well, over there, up in Belfast, it's pronounced Mulvaney, apparently. So, uh, and, yes. there's no, and there's no Y on the end. Apparently, over there, you guys spell it with M-U-L-V-A-N-E. And then when they came here and they added a Y. I don't know. Oh, yeah. They just wanted to be even more special, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was last over there in, uh, in 2010, actually. I backpacked all around the Ireland. Uh, and uh, actually, I flew into Shannon. Yeah. And then went up through Donegal and up through the Giants Causeway and all that. And then hit, I had hit Belfast. And then the only thing I, because I, I backpacked everything and used buses. That was it. No rental cars, nothing. And then I did take the train from Belfast to Dublin because I wanted to close out my trip with two solid days in Dublin. Because you guys got a lot going on over in Dublin. Yeah, it's pretty buzzing. Very popular with uh, people from abroad coming over. A lot yeah. of stag weekends happen there as well for <laughs> UK people and Europe. <laughs> All right. So for, for, admittedly, the majority of my downloads and my audience are here in the continental US and Canada, mind you. We have a strong Canadian following, but we do have European. But could you please define the stag factor real quick? Because maybe people have never heard that before. Oh, right. Well, the stag party is when a man is going to be married shortly. Okay. Uh, he goes with all his buddies and they have a big night in the town. And often there's some abuse goes on, like he may get tied to a pole and stripped naked and later in the evening. And that's kind of the stag party. And the hen party is the lady's equivalent. Where so you guys are just, it's just your way of a bachelor or a bachelorette party. Um, it, Right? I mean, yes, it sounds like yes, absolutely. Over here, we call it the bachelor party and mm. the bachelorette party. Um, I don't know if I'm actually going to have one because I'm actually engaged to be married uh, in March of 2019. So uh, I'm just not into them anymore. I don't know. I'm 40. So I'll be 41 in September. I just don't care. Um, I don't know about you. I mean, you've been. <laughs> what what I is got, your <laughs> Yeah, I got married at, I think it was 29. But yeah, I agree. If you're getting married at 40, maybe you've moved beyond that kind of messing. Yeah. Well, admittedly, the last two months. So uh, it's funny, ladies and gentlemen, before, right before this, um, Ivor was emailing me. We wanted to kind of realign the schedule for today. Uh, we just had a huge storm move through here. A lot of rain the past couple of days. And people are sending me pictures from a mountain biking trail system that I, I help take care of and volunteer at. And I'm the, I'm the wizard with the chainsaw. So I'm going to be, after this, going over there and cutting up a tree to help open up the trail systems from the storm damage. It's something I love to do. So uh, it gives me an excuse to use play with power tools. <laughs> yeah. I always, it sounds weird, but I always loved uh, chainsaws as well. When I was very young, my friend's farm, we used to use them. Yeah. Quite dangerous though for the kickback, of course. Well, yes, yes. Yeah. And, the, and the modern chainsaws, I um, mean, you know, they, they do have the, the kickback break. So, yeah. which is most importantly, that's why you have to hold it a certain way. If you yeah. try and switch grip, when it does kick back, your forearm is not in the right position to catch that, and you won't hit mm. the break on the, on the bar. Ladies and gentlemen, you're learning a lot about chainsaws today, so not just about fat. <laughs> but, really? See, that's fun. See, I, I grew up on a farm. I was actually uh, born in New Jersey uh, here on the East Coast, and we, my dad had a dairy farm back then, 
and we uh, and then eventually moved to Pennsylvania and we didn't have a full functioning like production type dairy farm anymore but he wanted us to grow up on a farm learn the hard work um, I, I used to take care of like a quarter acre garden for our food uh, it's funny because I joke around now this is actually a perfect segue for you. It's like, everybody's all about the all natural and organic and everything else. And I'm just like, well, you guys are kind of just doing what I did as, as a kid. I mean, we, we fed our animals and back then we fed them, we fed them hay or, or alfalfa or clover leaf, like actual green material that grew in a field, not copious amounts of grain or molasses and all this other stuff that we feed the cattle nowadays. But um, yeah, and then you take their manure and you put it on the soil and then you, you, you till it under and then you plant seeds and you grow a giant garden. And yeah, and I, that was before poisons and pesticides and chemicals and all this other stuff. So yeah, for sure. And I spent a lot of time on the farm myself. And the only thing I remember really was the nitrate fertilizer was spread mm-hmm. on the grass. But outside of that, there was nothing added. And, well, uh, and yeah. the nitrate, I think, was only added, I mean, because obviously in case for some reason the fertilization level wasn't strong enough, right? You need to, you got to equalize the soil with the right amount of nitrogen, correct? Essentially, yeah. It's yeah. not like, you know, all the pesticides and things that are used nowadays. I mean, it was just nitrogen to bring up the balance. Yeah. So it, otherwise, it was pretty clean, you know? Yeah. And well, it was a great time. And you learn as well the, the value of hard work. I mean, we had to work 14 our days sometimes bringing in that hay, that mm-hmm. grass, and then packing it in to make silage. Yeah. You, oh yeah. So you guys did use silage over there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, it was amazing because it obviously all ferments down, and then this black juice treacle comes out, and the cows go crazy for that stuff. They literally break down the gate to get at that juice. Oh yeah. That's all the, natural. The odor isn't the greatest for us. Um, it definitely has a, a pungent yeah. uh, smell to it. But it's funny because now I can drive past the farm and now they, they do this at a, at a much larger level here in the continental U.S. And I see these giant white plastic tubes. I mean, it's just, it's just stretch tight, thin plastic, but it's like the width of a car, an automobile, but the length, it, it could be a football field long. And sometimes there's two or three tubes of this and they're just packing it full of exactly what you're talking about. They're literally storing silage. So... I don't know if they do that over there. We have a lot more ground over here to cover stuff with. So, um, yeah, I think over here it's it's there's a lot of smaller farms and not so many massive enterprises, and that's yeah. the way Ireland's kind of managed. So it's all grass fed by definition, and the silage is usually individual farms piling it into a silage pit and then covering it with plastic and old car tire, automobile tires to keep the plastic down. So it's yeah. kind of more hand done. Yeah. Well. And, and again, shout out to Ireland again, not just because of my, most of my bloodline, not all of it. I did have my 23 and me DNA analysis com- completed. So, uh, but I do enjoy, uh, and this, I'm just going to call this fatty coffee. I don't need to call it bulletproof. Okay. I, I didn't blend it or anything. I, t- I just, I, I, f- I actually make fresh French press coffee and just take a big spoon of Kerry Gold, grass-fed Irish butter, and s- put that right in there. <laughs> Stir it yeah. up. The heat of the coffee melts it. I don't need a blender. I'm good to go. So, Absolutely. And you know, I well, we'll get to chatting about this later, but my style is now for a long time, I generally don't really eat breakfast, but I get French press or espresso coffee. As it happens, I'm not crazy about the butter in the coffee and all oh. the little globules. So I put in heavy cream, Irish double cream, we call it. I'm jealous. I, yeah, I'm not sure in America. Oh, America heavy cream, it's called, I think. Double cream in Ireland. Well, see, I don't think our heavy cream is still as cool as your double cream because we're so overly anal, about, anal retentive about the wrong elements <laughs> with our nutrition over the past, oh, 20 plus 30 years of down the wrong path, which is, again, why we're bringing you on the show and why you've been on Vinny Tortorich's Fitness Confidential show so much and why people love to follow you and your online feeds. Um, so we're digging into fat right now, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get into this here. So real quick, let's, let's get a little history. I've been following you for a while. Thanks to Vinny. I didn't even know about you. So Real quick, I'm going to do a little screen share here for the, for the video followers. So make sure you check him out at thefatemperor.com. And I love the little quote in the corner there, only a life lived for others 
is a life worthwhile. I've used that exact image, by the way, in my Instagram feed over the years. So I love that. So why the fat emperor? Because <laughs> I'm a marketing guy and a branding guy. And I was like, man, he just went right for the royalty component. I love it. <laughs> might come across as a bit arrogant, but it, it really wasn't the intention. It was actually one evening uh, after I discovered all of this about um, that carbohydrate was much more of an issue than fats in the diet. And I'd fixed my own health, my own blood markers. And I was researching intensively cholesterol, metabolism, everything. But during this process, I decided to start giving talks to the engineers in my corporation. You know, 100 plus people explaining metabolic syndrome and all this stuff. And one evening with my wife, I was sitting there and we were talking about, I think it was about branding. And with a short discussion, I realized, well, I've got this thing about the emperor's new clothes because all these researchers for 40, 50 years, a lot of them would have realized that the data was very weak against fat, but no one could say a word. Otherwise, mm. their funding would be cut. So everyone kept their mouth shut. And there was an emperor's clothes thing. And then there was the emperor, it occurred to me, as a good image for the corporate power that has funded science and kept us on the wrong track. I mean, it's just business. It's not conspiracy. You know, and everyone was at it. That's a great and clarification, actually, just to pause there. I mean, because I'm from the business world. And you just really nailed something people don't understand. They, they think it is all political and everything else. Like, no, 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 no. It does become political. But in the end, it's all about the dollars. It's, or, or, you know whatever form of income you're using, <laughs> the monetary value. Absolutely. And in fairness, corporations are required by law to put the profit for the shareholders first. Right. Now, they're not allowed to break the law, but that is their primary goal. And if they don't do it and put shareholders first, they're actually technically breaking the law. Uh, so, so yeah, it's all just about making profit and booming our business, increasing revenue. And you will, of course, bend some rules a little to do that, not break them. And you can fund the guys that you have, your favorite professors and teams, and they know where the money's coming from and they know the desired answers. So it's just a mild corruption that gets into the system. But it's not a big conspiracy. There's no crazy guy with a cat at the top, you know, stroking a cat. It's just all of the businesses benefit by this this bad paradigm over decades. I mean, pharmaceutical benefit hugely because of all the sickness that results. A food industry benefits because they can use dirt cheap vegetable oils and refined carbohydrates with long shelf life. So long story short, if all the big businesses benefit by this incorrect idea, then you'll find they will all tend to encourage it and preserve it. And that's all that happened. But okay. Long story short, the third, it was a three-part metaphor. The third one was just, I had this image of the bloated, obese, kind of sad emperor, like the average obese person, diabetic these days, you know, on insulin and their life is ruined. And, and that was kind of an image of this sad, pathetic emperor. Uh, and really, it isn't that person's fault. Not, not much. It's mostly that their government's nutritional guidelines and their society never protected them from these kind of poisonous foods. Mm -hmm. So they got trapped in a cycle of obesity and increasing hunger and lethargy. And in a way, I really, yeah, you can't blame the people who have been trapped by this. Well, in the end, right now, at least in 2018 here, right, there is a lot of blaming back and forth going on. And one thing that I appreciate when I follow people like yourself, Jeffrey Gerber, uh, and a lot of the other, uh, as Vinny calls them, luminaries in the field, which I do like that little spin on things, uh, is that there's a lot of stuff being thrown back and forth. In the end, all I care about, and what I, what I think most people deep, deep down care about is as we get to a point where we know too much, like myself, now it's like, okay, we want to find the people who are trying to create the legitimate positive change. Uh, or in this case, I've been starting to call it the reversal. I don't know if it necessarily would be valid to call it a reversal. I'm intrigued for your opinion on that because you work with a lot of the science, um, obviously from an engineering level in the health sciences. So are we technically trying to get people to say, hey guys, let's go back 30, 40 years and hit the reset switch? Or can we not really even do that right now? It's a matter of starting a whole new chapter. Yeah. Wow. That's a good one, Scott. It's a quagmire because right. if we were slightly 
tuning or adjusting the advice of the last 40 years, then you'd find that the professional pride of all the researchers and all the people who have staken the advice given, uh, they'd probably be reasonably open to moving along with some slight changes. Mm -hmm. But the very problem is it's more akin to a reversal. And that's what's causing so much tension because the people who have said this for decades spent whole careers saying low fat, you know, high carb vegetable oils are good for you. All of that advice kind of has to be reversed. And that means they were wrong. And that's why there's a huge pushback as well as industry, of course, do not want to change to whole foods, higher fat, lower carb, because it'll ruin the intercontinental high shelf life corporate business. So yeah, it's more of a reversal. And I, I like to think of it as it struck me one day as quite shocking. Something hit me that all of the main advices of the past 40 or 50 years, most of them have turned out to be incorrect. Mm -hmm. So if you flipped a coin six, seven times, you'd be unlikely to get, you know, six heads and one tail. But the only thing they really got correct solidly was smoking is bad for you. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, I, I just thought through the others, um, salt, high salt being bad for you is, is not really true at all. It is in rare cases, but the salt message has been incorrect. Uh, the fat message has been largely incorrect. The carbohydrate, I believe the vegetable oil, mm -hmm. um, and oh, completely staying out of the sun and covering yourself in sunblock has kind of backfired too. Oh, let's, let's throw cholesterol in there, right? Cholesterol, is, oh, right? oh, there's a biggie. Wait, wait, uh, wait, this whole thing, like, wait a minute, cholesterol is actually necessary for cellular functionality. Um, if you don't consume it, your body's going to make it, right? I mean, because it Yeah, <laughs> and, well, that one, if you dwell on that one alone, the dietary cholesterol, even Ansel Keys, who is the architect of, you know, Fat in the diet drives like, up your I like cholesterol. to call him the, the guy with the cat. He's the Dr. Evil. All right. <laughs> in, right? In, in a sense, yeah. But, but equally, he was following his own nose at the time. And he probably believed his own BS. And I think later he probably realized, you know, that it was much more complex. But it doesn't matter. You can't forgive him because he fought so hard without supporting data and he attacked Yudkin, Professor Yudkin, and everyone who talked against him. So because he fought so hard for his theory that didn't have enough data behind it, you've you got to say he's guilty. But yeah, he's a bit, of a bit of a cat figure, all right. Well, I mean, cat figure aside, you know what? Let's, let's neutral play this, right? It's, hmm. He was working off of whatever research, well, well, I'll air quote that, research hmm. compared to somebody like yourself, research that he supposedly had to back his opinions and then he was, here's the thing about him. And then you probably know more about him than I do, but from what I've researched and just when I look at the, the kind of impact he created and how it's sustained for this long period of time, he was really good as a business professional. I'm a big proponent and I love coaching people on the power of networking and connecting with the right people and then using the power of your network to grow and succeed and help each other. Well, in the end, that's what that guy nailed. He took his lowly researched opinions, built a strong network of influencers and found the right people at the political level to help back it and boom, just locked it in. So you got to give them a few points on just being really good at networking and knowing exactly who's going to, you know, basically back his initiatives. So absolutely, Scott, I would give him huge credit for that. And in our book, uh, Eat Rich, Live Long, we actually did a very short version of the Ansel story because Gary Taubes in Good Calories, Bad Calories has done it. Nina yep. Teicholz in The Big Fat Surprise. So it's really been told. So we did a short, but we called that out, actually, that he was dynamic. He was persuasive. He was politically savvy. He, he had all of these really strong qualities. And by God, he was extremely effective in getting his ideas established. And he, be, he got involved with the American Heart Association. I think he got on the board. Exactly as you say. Now, unfortunately, tragically, if you're correct and you show that great leadership like that, everyone wins. And if you're wrong and you do, oh, boom. Well, I, I, again, I look at it as this. Unfortunately, he, he did a good job <laughs> and built a sustainable empire off of his idiocy. I'll just, I'll say it. So, but let's look at that, okay, and let's study 
what he did right as far as his techniques, his networking, his connectability. And, and, and that's where it's like, I'm not going to bash the guy. I'm going to take the strengths that he showed that we could learn from. Now, how do we do the same thing? How do we take his best practices, but then do it with the right information, the right data, the right healthy influencers to turn the tide and turn the tables, whether it be calling it back, you know, backing up the clock or starting that new chapter and saying, guys, okay, he did these things right. Let's do that but now with the right data and the right education. Exactly. Take a leaf from his book, the, the good leaf. And, yeah. uh, and I agree. Um, and these are, and in fact, I can, I can think of another example. I, I'm quite interested in World War II documentaries, mm. but in the past six to 12 months, I've watched a ton of them. That's my leisure time. And interestingly, you've got a lot of evil characters there, but you can really learn from their strategy. And all the things that worked, even if it was good work by, by evil people to an evil end, it's fascinating. So similarly, and with Ansel Keys, yeah, all the things he did right, he got connected really well. He networked, like you say. He, he strategically attacked opponents. Now, he may have gone a little overboard, but it worked. Oh, he definitely and, did. <laughs> yeah, he, he went overboard. And in, with posterity, looking back, it, it was disgraceful. But at the time, it worked. I mean, it really shut Yudkin up. Yudkin was not able to handle, I think, that amount of abuse, public abuse, and, and he would have been cowed. So, I mean, you've got to be careful with that particular power if you flex it. But, you know, you've got to be very aggressive in ways out there. I'm, I'm relatively aggressive, and I try and balance it, you mm -hmm. know, especially on Twitter. I'm, I'm very in your face, and I will argue you know, to the last with all the people who, who disagree. Yeah. And I think there's value in that robust argument and even, even an element of poking fun or, or perhaps a little unfairly, it spices up the discussion. But if you go overboard, maybe it backfires. So that, that, uh, uh, see, I'm a big marketing guy. So I'm with you on this. Uh, like this is really part of Vinnie Tortorich's brand that I've been helping him with. Uh, and you're never going to make everybody happy. Okay, this is business 101, marketing 101, sales 101. Define your target audience and make them happy because they're, the, they're your target audience. Ignore everybody else. But yeah, are you going to get the trollers and the, the people trying to start little fires and everything else? Absolutely. But in the end, let them talk their talk. And then yes, if you want to have fun with them, who cares if you upset them because they're not your target audience. And over time, somebody like yourself, who's backing it up with legitimate data, legitimate research, and with the right influencers, eventually uh, there is going to be a small percentage of those initial haters that will eventually also get turned and realize, wait a minute, maybe I need to actually read this stuff before criticizing it and then realizing, okay, maybe I'm actually in the wrong, but it, it takes time to do that. Yeah. And I think they do need time to reflect because and often they're the ones that are ideologically driven like very staunch vegans or or vegetarian it's a little harder because i guess and i i don't blame them for this but they don't really want to change their mind it's not just the science you know there's a driver there that really demands that the fat was bad the animal products are bad and, and that ain't going to change with data oh, but i, I think yeah. I, have, I have friends in the CrossFit space. I'm a huge CrossFit guy. So uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a CFL1 coach, all that. And I have a friend, a very good friend of mine. She's a fellow coach. I watched her go from just being an, a, a beginner vegan athlete to you know, becoming a coach and now a CrossFit gym owner. She's more passionate than I am. And I do call her a friend. Do I agree with her lifestyle choices? No, because we are omnivores. But she chose that path out of passion, spiritual passion. Like she, again, I respect that. So people who are vegans, I get it. I understand it. At least the ones that are doing it for the, for the right reasons. Um, but in the end, there is way too much science backing up the fact that the age old argument that I, I learned from Vinny and you guys is all I got to do is drop the bomb B12. And I, I, I just destroy your entire opinion on proper human diet. <laughs> Yeah, the B12 is a big one. And I know there's the arguments that we drank dirty water when we thousands of years ago and we got some B12 from the bacteria. But let's be honest, it's, it's, it's a nuclear device, yes, yeah. uh, for that yeah, argument. But also, that was yeah. thousands of years ago. The mineral density of whatever they were trying to choose back then is a heck of a lot different than the mineral density that we have today. Yeah, we have a whole load of other headwinds against us. So we need the 
nutrition elements even more to counter the other bad stuff. But yeah, and and likewise, I have a, a budding medical group of doctors in Ireland, mm-hmm. um, maybe 12 or 14. And one of our people is a psychiatrist who is not just vegetarian, she's vegan. Ooh. And she's all on board because although she chooses that, she doesn't want to try and convince people of her lifestyle. She does it for the right reasons. She's not trying to convert you. And okay. she accepts all the stuff about om- omnivores. And she's very careful with her diet, though, of course. So, um, and can we name drop her? Like, who, who are you referring to? Uh, at the moment, it's kind of an early budding group. Okay. Uh, okay. She's a psychiatrist, you know, in her late 40s. Okay. And uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't drop the name because we're not really out there yet. Well, that's fine because I, I can at least talk to somebody who has, I, I know, is, sounds like a very similar person um, because she's already publicly all over Vinny's page. But here, let me screen share real quick. So mm-hmm. I'm going to shout out to, because she, she just aired her episode on Vinny's show. So this one is Dr. Carrie, uh, I think you could pronounce it Dialus or Dialus. Anyway, so her story is great too. She's a vegan doctor and she still is vegan, but she supports this, uh, you know, obviously Vinny's trademark of the NSNG, the no sugar, no grains lifestyle, trying to find ways to source healthy fats, cutting the processed sugars and, the, and all the, the low carb processed crap out of your lifestyle. So I love that because she shared this before and after photo of herself. So again, still living a vegan lifestyle, but backing up a lot of everything we're talking about, which is, well, there's still some things you got to be focusing on whether you're vegan or not vegan. Yeah. And the commonality actually is, is very large. I mean, get your magnesium, get healthy sun exposure, no refined carbs or sugars, no vegetable oil. I mean, the vegans generally know as well not to use vegetable oil, use olive or, or natural. Or so avocado can, oils. or yeah. Avocado, yeah. So there's a huge overlap, ironically. When you talk about conflict or political kind of aspects of this, there, ironically, like in many conflicts, there's a huge overlap where we do agree. Uh, but with some people where we don't agree becomes a real touch point. And a, that's, that's where people go and have the fights. <laughs> so is that some of what, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I just love technology and screen sharing. Again, video feed, he brought it up earlier. And for the listeners, Eat Rich, Live Long. Okay, this book was co-authored by Ivor. But also, uh, again, I mentioned him earlier, Jeffrey Gerber. I can't wait to get him on the podcast. Uh, but Eat Rich, Live Long. Was that some of the power behind why you guys worked on this project? I mean, besides just getting truth out in general, but because uh, this tug of war seems to be always going on. Yeah, well, the genesis of that book, um, I originally wrote a version of it back in 15 because an Irish entrepreneur, David Bobbitt, Mm -hmm. who uh, owns a $700 million corporation uh, with offices all over the world, he found me because he had discovered low carb after he had discovered with a calcium scan that he had massive heart disease, even though the medical business had told him he was the top five or 10% fitness at the age of 52, Hmm. past the treadmills, everything. Long story short, he got a random calcium scan, which I now promote, um, and he found out he was the worst 1% of heart disease for his age. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. He went, he went, he got really angry. And a month (laughs) or two later, he discovered that he was hugely type two diabetic and they'd never diagnosed that either. Well, what medical office was he going to? Yeah, the best executive medicals. I mean, we can sidetrack briefly just to explain. His HbA1c was 5.3. His fasting glucose was normal. And all of his stress tests passed, everything passed. But they did not measure his insulin. Mm. They never measured his post-meal glucose. And because he was running four times a week and super slim and fit, his classic risk factors that might usually show a person to have a problem they were all kept looking good. Wow. But when they tested his blood glucose straight after a random meal, it was going up to 300 milligrams and more. And so that's that a classic is- sign of type 2 diabetes? or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the best test for type 2 diabetes is a post-glucose insulin. So say two hours after you drink 75 grams of glucose, you take an insulin. Okay. And that that, that's an earlier test, but a post-meal glucose shooting up is a dead giveaway, yeah. So yeah, I, I can relate only because my father became type 2 diabetic. Like he was never type 2 diabetic until eh, it's probably approaching 10 years ago. Um, now, granted, through 
very slow <laughs> lifestyle shifts of my influence with him. Uh, we've got him down to just one medication. I don't know what, I forget which one he's on right now, but I have to relate this to you because you're the data guy. Okay. You, uh, and real quick, I'll pause my quick uh, story segue to reinforce this diabetes discussion. But again, for our listeners, as an engineer, you are working with health science teams, right? And scientists, like you're looking at this data that you're talking about right now. Oh, well, yeah. As an engineer for 30 years, I was a leader of teams in complex problem solving efforts in the corporate sphere and high volume electrofluidic devices, uh, very complex. And I was also a manager. But since six years ago, I've switched essentially to hardcore metabolic health research yeah. and cholesterol and insulin and all of these things. So I'm really specializing in that for many years now. Uh, the beauty is though, I've got a huge worldwide network, we'll come back to network, uh, of uh, researchers, professors, MDs, all over the world. I mean, an enormous network now. And we constantly compare notes. So all of my research, uh, Dr. Gerber, who co-authored the book, Eat Rich, Live Long, obviously is my closest um, ally. And he has not only all of his own research, but he has 25 years of clinical experience. And he's been low carb since nearly 20 years ago, wow. applies it to his patients and sees all of the clinical results as well as the research. But I'm deeper in the research. Um, well, and, that, and that's beauty. Like play to your strengths, right? You're the guy who geeks out on data. So good. You dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And I love the fact that you, you, you added into your segue here that the power of your network is that nowadays more than ever, there is no excuse not to be sharing data, sharing information, cross-pollinating, um, obviously, everything that you guys are learning along the way. Because that's what's exciting is that now more than ever, we're seeing amazing leaps in science. We always have, but it's getting, it's getting accelerated. But in this case, I, I'm, I'm not excited about medications and drugs. I'm excited about the health advancements and the knowledge from nutritional advancement, uh, the, the value of rest and recovery, sleep cycles, your, your circadian rhythm. I mean, all of these components come into balancing your healthy lifestyle. It's not just nutrition. Now, obviously, today, we're digging heavily into how you fuel your body. But part of fueling your body and fueling your brain is rest and recovery, hydration, the salts, and then obviously going back to the nutrition. Would you agree? I would agree, absolutely. In fact, some of the slides I use specifically emphasize that nutrition is a big part of this problem of modern chronic disease, which has afflicted us. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a whole load of other elements. And I always mention as well, like the three S's, sleep, stress, and well, actually supplements. Uh, to keep it separate just from food like magnesium, potassium, and things you're not going to get as readily from generic food nowadays. But yeah, I, and the beauty is there's a synergy and there's an interaction. So insulin resistance, which you can get from bad food, refined carbs, sugars, vegetable oils, and insulin resistance syndrome is a huge causal driver of cardiovascular disease and much more. Hmm. However, if you get very poor sleep, it's shown in human studies, your insulin sensitivity can have in a few weeks. And if you are very stressed and releasing stress hormones, your insulin rises. If Cortisol smoke, levels. Yeah. And if you smoke, your insulin and insulin resistance rises, right? Because of the, the damage and the insult to your lipoproteins and your other cells from the smoking and the oxidation causes the immune system to react and insulin rises. Mm. And infections as well drive up insulin. So the beauty is that although there are all these different factors, they all kind of join together and interact and similar great blood measures can be used to identify any, many of these problems, not just the dietary ones. So yeah, I'd agree. It's a, it is a multi-factor problem, but the engineering principle is Pareto. And that's that around 20% of the causes of a problem, even if there are a hundred different ones, around 20% of them will account for around 80% of the uh, improvement you can wow. get by fixing. So we always say, well, what are the top 10? And in the book, we have top 10, and you've just mentioned several of them right there. Yeah. 
Well, I, again, I, I read all the books <laughs> and, I, and I listen to all the podcasts. And this is something that I teach people through this podcast and social media too, is like, guys, like nowadays more than ever, there's no excuse not to become your own self-educated health nut. You don't have to be as geeked out as I am or Ivor is, but you at least take personal accountability for your health. And I personally don't go to an MD anymore. I mean, unless I cut myself, break myself or something else, I'm not saying everybody stop doing that, but I know more about nutrition than a traditional MD. I've, I've, I have no problem saying that on my own show because I crush podcasts, books, audiobooks day in and day out. When I, I travel on business a lot, I don't have an FM radio station or a radio station program in my car anymore. I'm streaming data. I tell people all the time, turn your automobile or your train ride or your bike. Well, I'm a, I'm a big cyclist. I try not to use headphones when I bike. But, but the point is, turn your commutes into a mobile university process. So taking accountability, becoming your own inner physician or your self-educated physician. Because just hanging out here with no knowledge and no opinion because you're not doing any self-education, that's a dangerous place to be, for me, in my opinion anyway. So. Absolutely. And, and it's the way it is nowadays. I mean, the doctor's biggest challenge is a lack of nutritional knowledge. And in fairness, they've been, they've been kind of baked in a system that has, has not pushed that knowledge towards them. A bit like we talked about business earlier, and would never want to encourage a lot of the things we're talking about because it's bad for business. Sure. Uh, but, but even on physiology, it's fascinating that uh, I took the example of David Bobbitt and his team's top end, because he's a massively wealthy guy, he's getting the best teams, uh, they also are missing certain blood tests or the calcium scan and its power. So they're missing diagnostics as well that they don't fully understand. I, I give you an example. I talked to a very senior um, doctor once uh, and I brought up insulin as being a primary problem in disease much more so than cholesterol or fat. Mm -hmm. And this doc was saying, but come on, we know cholesterol's bad and we know that fat's bad. And, and what, what, you know, if it's not that, what is it? So I, I broached the topic of insulin and hyperinsulin. And he looked at me genuinely confused. And he said, what, for, for diabetics? And I realized as his face clouded over, he only knows insulin as a medication for diabetics. Yeah. And he's trying to figure how is Ivor telling me that a medication for diabetics is what's causing a lot of chronic disease? And he didn't register it as like insulin in the body. Because he doesn't know. He doesn't they, know. Yeah, they're not, yeah. Taught, they're not taught this in a traditional educational plan. I mean, obviously, I don't know Ireland and, 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 this, and the universities over there, but I, I've learned this. I've had, I've had I have friends of mine that are ER doctors and every doctor that I've ever talked to, they all agree that up to one to two hours, maybe up to 16 to 20 hours of education, that's it in your MD education, is on nutrition. And you, mostly it's about how things metabolize in the body and, and what organs do what, like the, pan, the importance of the pancreas and all that. But there's no in-depth education on, for example, insulin response. Uh, the, uh, uh, what's the triggers for the roller coaster ride of your hormonal imbalances, right? The triggers and the impacts on leptin and ghrelin, okay? and Hello, my, my initial degree that I didn't finish was in engineering, but then I, you know, got into technology and some startup companies and then went back years later and finished a BS in marketing and psychology. I have zero MD medical experience, but I've been spending the past eight years doing health coaching and because of my commitments to this. And I tell people, yes, I'm, I'm not your dietitian and I'm not your doctor, but all I can do is talk to what I know. And at least t I tell people, become your own inner physician. Do some of the self-study. Try it. <laughs> yeah, and find, I mean, ideally, like you do or like I have done as well. My initial journey back in 13 was I went straight to the databases because I have a biochemical engineering degree and I have 30 years of problem-solving practice and, and, you know, theory. So I was able to go straight to the databases, re research my problem, and do it all myself. But Anyone out there can find leaders who are MDs, uh, who are researchers, who are professors, who are putting out the material you're talking about and explaining all these things. And I mean, the doctors 
they learn about insulin and how it works uh, in college. Sure they do. But no one gives them a good grounding on hyperinsulinemia. Mm. And that diabetes is really a disease of insulin, not of glucose. That's what happened to my dad. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's it, why he's a type two, he was never a type two diabetic. And then all of a sudden, 10 years ago, he becomes a type two diabetic. Hmm. Well, yeah. And to give you an example, just of one Chinese study, uh, though I have hundreds of studies on this, uh, they got the insulin response post a glucose drink a la craft, the craft type test. And they looked at the five responses of insulin and the people who had a good response, uh, 12 years later, 3% had type two diabetes, which is really low, but there was 40 to 45% of the people with the bad insulin response were diagnosed, I think it was 12 years later. So Mm. you can predict a decade in advance with post glucose insulin that you're heading for diabetes. But of course, and like your father, they only actually diagnose when his blood glucose has gone out of control. And that's very late. And yeah. a lot of damage has happened. And now you're, now you're putting in, uh, as I like to call medications, the medical Band-Aid. It's not, it, this is Western medicine, not Eastern medicine, right? Instead of tracing the root cause, we're, we're applying a medical Band-Aid. Granted, it is proven by science, but I was like, it's not you're not reversing the process that triggered the, the onslaught of diabetes. You're just treating the symptoms and trying to balance it out. How are you going to get him back to before that? Because I truly do believe that diabetes is curable. I've seen people go off of drugs. Yes. Now, that's an interesting one, Scott. So I think when you've damaged your machine, your metabolism, and you've become diabetic, uh, some people can go to practically cured uh, with all their bloods fine and no medications. Some people get their bloods a lot better, but it struggled to get right back to perfect bloods, but drop their medications a lot. Uh, In a sense though, cure, cure kind of means you could go back eating what you used to eat and it might take you 10 or 15 years before you develop it again. Hmm. But these people who were diabetic, they can fix the diabetes get off their meds, get healthy, and drastically reduce all the comorbidities of diabetes, heart attacks, massively change their life uh, expectancy back to a healthy person. They can do all that. But if they start eating the bad stuff again, they probably will pretty rapidly descend back into the the problem. To to your point, Mm. we're trying to reverse and cure, right? In this this example scenario. But if you then go and counter reverse what we well, just taught you to fix the said problem and get to the root cause. And you then go and do the same thing over definition of insanity. You do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Yeah, true. And the only thing is they might've done, I don't know, 10 units of bad eating to get the diabetes over 20, 30 years. But now if they go back and even do a half a unit of bad eating, they might end up quickly back where they were. It's just they'd they be sensitive now more. I, I, tell, I tell my dad all the time and my mother, everybody in my family, by the way, does not look like me. Like right now, <laughs> You're I, just, great. I, just, I just did my first triathlon last, last, last uh, weekend or I attempted it. I, I, have a, I have water panic. I've done all this adrenaline sports. I need a little bit more swimming training. I only, I only trained for six weeks to try and learn how to swim and then try to go do a triathlon. The swim yeah. did not go well. <laughs> I I have the exact same in 2007. My buddies were all decided to do triathlons and I had to go to the pool for around eight or nine weeks just to learn how to swim. Yeah. And eventually I did after around 20 sessions, I suddenly got it and began to be able to do 20 lengths, 30 lengths. Yeah. But, but you're right. I'm not that comfortable in the water. Give me a, a, I've done multi hundred mile biking events. I used to do, I don't know what that is in kilometers. I used to do uh, endurance mountain bike racing when I lived in Colorado. I love endurance sports. I've done marathons, half marathons. I've done these races over here called Ragnar relays that are 200 mile relays that you do with a team. I love this stuff. I skydive. I've been, a, I've been a wildland firefighter uh, when I left the corporate world. I spent, that's where the fire came from. I was a, one of the federal wildland firefighters, one of the elite hotshots out West. So did all that. Water is my, <laughs> that's the Achilles heel, man. Um, yeah. But anyway, I was telling people, I was like, right now, thank, because of all the swimming, I've been having to reprogram some of my dietary practices because 
I dropped like five pounds. I didn't, I was like, whoa, I did a major shift. And I'm, like I said, I CrossFit, I bike, I do, I'm so active that I just got to do some reprogramming. But like right now I'm 190 pounds at six foot four. So wow. I'm healthy, I'm fit. And you know what I had this morning? This fatty coffee. And then right before the show today, I, I made my, uh, my, my five egg omelet with a side of four sticks of bacon. <laughs> mm, nice. So, you make me hungry now because right? all I had was the coffee today and now it's 6 p.m. Yeah. And then what I do is I got one of these hand pump things that you can uh, turn olive oil into more of like a spray. So, and I use a cast iron skillet. So I sprayed the whole inside of the pan and then I put a little bit of Kerry Golden butter in there just to lubricate the pan. And then I threw the eggs in. So it's just fat on top of fat on top of fat. And people are just like, you're going to die. And I'm like, really? Hmm. Well, apparently not. If not. You, <laughs> not if you if you don't eat refined carbohydrate, vegetable oils, and other problem foods with it, it's almost certainly fine. There may be a slight exception. Uh, you know about the ApoE4 genotype, or not? The, uh, we did. I, uh, have you heard of Dr. Anthony J? He's a I've geneticist. heard of. Does he get into that a lot, or? Well, so he does. So he and I did a big Facebook Live and a podcast episode. He's been on the show a couple times because we. Uh, Back last year when the AHA released that article that coconut oil kill, is going to kill you. Oh, um, God. I, saw I, brought, I, brought, I brought him on. Um, I brought on uh, Dr. Wolfson, the paleo cardiologist. And then I brought on my regular sports nutritionist. And we, the next three episodes straight was just us ripping on the AHA. <laughs> <laughs> had Excellent. So much, had so much fun with that. Um, yeah. But I, Anthony J was one of them. And he's doing work with the Mayo Clinic right now on genetics. Uh, but anyway, so part of his service is that I had no idea, but I, I posted that I had, a, I got one of the 23 Me kits for Valentine's Day from my fiance. And she, and she's like, here, I know you geek out about this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I want to mm. see my, 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 where I come from, but we got the health data. And Anthony's like, Scott, he's like that health data is so surface level. He said, what you can do is he's like, you can go into 23 Me website and export the raw data file. He's like, send that to me. He's like, that's what I do. People pay him like 300 bucks. He'll, raw, he'll analyze your 23andMe raw data file just for the health components. And then he breaks everything down based on what are the key supplements, uh, chemicals to avoid, everything else based on your genetic markers. It was so much fun. So I wouldn't be surprised if what you're bringing up is probably in that report. I just can't think of it off the top of my head right now. And you're absolutely right, Scott. It is. Now, when I got it done many, many years ago, 23andMe, um, it didn't give you it. And you had to go yourself to a tool. I guess a tiny version of what he's doing and you work out from the numbers whether you're APOE4 or not. Okay. And yeah, but now they actually tell you if you are on oh. that one, on that particular one. But there's, there's lots more, I'm guessing. But no, I'm APO34. So with two strands of DNA, I'm APOE4 on one and I'm three on the other. So there's around 17% of people are APOE4, the 3 4 type. They're, okay. Yeah. And they have an increased risk for heart disease generally, not hugely, and a really increased risk for Alzheimer's, which is kind of type three diabetes. So it's the oldest human genome. It's the oldest type of human. And as a result, it appears generally we're more susceptible to modern bad foods. We're less adapted. Okay. So it's a risk. Now I found out I did 23 on me with my fifth child, my son, because we figured with his issues... I'm sorry, did I, you say fifth child? Yeah, I dropped that in there casually. <laughs> that was so casual. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> it's like, now my 10th child, however... Oh, yeah. No, I'm joking. <laughs> fifth and last child. And wow. uh, his name's Lee, but he had issues growing up um, and a huge sensitivity to wheat, sensitivity to refined carb, and other issues as well, a bone formation thing in his hip. He had profoundly low vitamin D when he was young. We discovered wow. before I understood that. And we realized, wow, if I'm E3-4 and my wife's E3-4, then, you know, some of our kids are going to be double four, which is huge risk. And he is. We got his 23 me back. He's, he's double E4, which is less than 1% of the population. And wow. they got to be really careful to eat ancestrally. I mean, really careful. They could have maybe 10 times the risk of Alzheimer's or more, you know, very sensitive. So, so when you say APO, however you said the APO E4, is that like the letters and AP like zero four or, or E4 it, or? Well, it's APO in kind of capitals dash E4. 
So apolipoprotein type. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're geeking out, ladies and gentlemen. You're yeah. going to want to go back and watch this YouTube feed. So I've brought up my genetic report from, oh. from Dr. Anthony J. So hold on a second. Real quick, this, was, this is a copy of what he sends you. So this is a PDF, a um, little intro, blah, blah, blah. He gives you a login to his site, a little passcode. Yeah. I don't care. I, I share all this. I don't care. So we talk like, he get, and he gives me a breakdown here. This is cool. Like, I need to eat more salt. I, got, I, I already know this. You know, I'm, I consume more water and salt. I, I had no idea. I mean, I am an adrenaline junkie, but apparently adrenaline stays in me more because of the calm tea. So I don't know if you, I mean, right. this is cool stuff. Like I, I do need more vitamin D, like you're talking about D3. Um, Complex, yeah, homocysteine. Yep, the yep. B6, the vitamin D, D, again, so cool, right? The, uh, the yeah. homocysteine, um, recommended obviously hitting the zinc, make sure that my dietary practice is zinc. Definitely on manganese. Oh, this was good. I've never taken this. I mean, I'm starting, I just tried a new supplement. Ah, uh, glutathione, yes, yeah, very important. So I just started that this month. I, I, I'm trying out a supplement for that, uh, these little gelatin uh, things, so. Right, and again, I think there's some discussion there as to how effective they are uh, in terms of giving you glutathione. Ideally, you'll, you'll eat and live in such a way that you're endogenous, Body produced glutathione is high, but certainly there's a lot of interest, yeah, in these now, liposomal, yeah, to boost. Mm. Oh, but, but real quick, so this is just like in the report. So what I did was I took this entire report, and there's a local magazine here that they asked me to write for, and I, I hate writing. <laughs> but so the past two issues over the past two quarters uh, since last year, I've been published in their magazine. So I took this entire report. And it was just published in the summer 2018 issue. So I, I, I said, listen, people need to see that you can do this. So I, I basically generated an entire article with 80% of the content is this. And I made sure Anthony was mentioned in it and he was tagged so people can go find this guy because, you know, I don't know how many magazines he's getting published in. So I want to make, I basically used my exposure to get him exposure. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. if you scroll down, I'm guessing, well, APOE4 is pretty here's a list yeah it's okay it's not it'll be it could be buried down there somewhere i think maybe if you had apoe4 it might get highlighted earlier on yeah well here's his website when i log in here's my he's gives me a list of all these uh, detox genes so i've never logged into this by the way it's my first time logging in and looking at all this stuff so would it be in this list maybe uh, it, it, it should really be called out as oh, a specific okay. type, but if it doesn't jump out, it could be buried there somewhere. You probably, uh, but you, you could ping him on it and see. Yeah, but I'm that. guessing maybe if you didn't have ApoE4, he might not particularly highlight it. Even 23andMe, they only bring it up in your okay. report if you are. So, yeah, okay. yeah maybe not. Well, Excellent. I mean, I think, I think part of this is, I figured you would appreciate this, is that... Mm. And I want to publicize all. I, I stuck it all out there. I said, listen, I have nothing to hide. I don't care about HIPAA and all this other stuff. Like over here, we have HIPAA, H I, you know, yeah. HIPP or HIPAA, or the whole medical privacy, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, listen, I want people to know that I have nothing to hide because that way people are like, oh, well, like I, I put on Instagram that I did a shot of olive oil uh, at my triathlon last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after the swimming segment, before I left on the bike ride, I literally just did a shot. I had, a, I had photos of that. And people were like, well, you, you probably perform better if you would actually eat real food. Uh, you know, there's always a troll, a trolling person. Uh, and I'm like, it is food, you idiot. It's literally fat juice from a fatty fruit, from yeah. an olive. It's whole I mean, food. <laughs> if, you, if you knock back a shot of Crisco... <laughs> they'd have a point, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it just, but, and, and that's, I swear it's like one thing I've learned and it's funny cause my fiance, she's a equine medical doctor, uh, you know, for horses and uh, she's also a doctor chiropractic. So she's on the wellness side too. And she, I mentioned something the other night, every once in a while I just get a little fired up and she's just like, you keep growing your brand online. She's like, you better grow a thicker skin. And I was like, you know, thank you for calling me out because I have a thick skin. But every once in a while, somebody, something just sets me off. And I'm like, really? And I think it's only because you become passionate about this stuff. Like you said earlier, your Twitter and everything. Yeah, you do get more outspoken because people need to understand that we believe in this. Like we already see a lot of people out there preaching all the wrong stuff. So we got to be out there preaching the right stuff. 
Exactly, and that's leadership. And leadership can hurt. Uh, there's no doubt about it. You need a thick skin. I had a, a fantastic uh, senior manager once many years ago, and he said, look, being so technical as you are, you're going to be correct on anything you research or look into around 95% of the time. Sometimes you're going to get caught out. But the, the, business, the, the business needs people to show the leadership and stand up when something's wrong and take a stand. And occasionally when you do that, you might get a little burnt and your pride will take a bruising. You'll stand up for something and you might not be correct. But you got to do it every time because most vast majority are going to be correct. And if people don't show leadership, you know, the business suffers. And just like you say, Scott, out there in this problem where you have millions, hundreds of millions of people dying too young, dreadful quality of life, leaving behind children, it's just a mess out there. And if people don't have the leadership to stand up and take the blows, then the other side will just keep the same crap science for the next 30 years. Well, it's, and what's, what's even worse is it's not what well, you just hinted at. Thank you for saying that, by the way, the whole leaving people behind. Or there's people that are losing the next generation before they should, right? That, that's how bad this has gotten. Now you're losing children, okay, due to the obesity de uh, demographics and, right. and diabetes in children. Children being born with this. We have a higher rate of child-born obesity, diabetes, and everything else now than ever, which is proving that we are breaking down our genetic code. I mean, we are destroying it because of these past decades of, of miseducation. It is dreadful. And I think the youngest type 2 diabetic it used to be adult onset. You never got it below your 40s. And the youngest now, I saw an article a couple of months ago, was two, two and a half years old, actual type 2 diabetic. And they couldn't believe it. So they had to do the test because they said it must be type 1. Yeah. And it, it was type 2. And the, the uh, gestational problem is that mothers, sadly, who become hyperinsulinemic and who develop these problems, they tend to encode the child in the womb with a sensitivity. And then that child comes out into the environment the mother has been in, eating the wrong things, and immediately starts getting orange juice and all these refined carb cereals. And they've come out with a predisposition, not their fault, and they're fed the same poison, and they get fatter, and diabetic even faster. And that's well, why we here, have... Here's the sad part. And this is where the self-education comes in. They don't know any better, especially here in the U.S. They're following the news, TV commercials, really well paid for marketing by the cereal companies and everything else. They, and here's the best part. What you just told us, what people are learning right now, ladies and gentlemen, we've already proven that things pass through blood-brain barriers, passing through the umbilical cord to children, that we've seen the commercials, try to protect your children from, you know, don't be doing drugs while you are literally creating a new life form. You know, drugs, smoking cigarettes, all of this. So they've already proven that this stuff is passing on to a child. But for some reason, people think it's impossible for you to pass on diabetes or, you know, obesity to a child before it's even born. Well, if we can do it with drugs and you can do it with cigarette smoking and everything else, why wouldn't you do it with that too? Yeah, you, desert, you disturb the incredibly fine balance of that complexity of creating a human. And with hyperglycemia, the baby gets hit with all that hyperglycemia in the womb. The poor little pancreas starts having to pump out insulin to manage it. And all this is happening before you're even born. Yeah, you're and literally are re you're reprogramming the pancreas with the wrong software. I mean, essentially, in a manner of speaking, yes. And then they, they have a predisposition and they come out into the same disastrous environment that their mother had and they start getting fed with the bad stuff. And then their children then again, decades down the road, you get more of it. So I think there's a second order effect that has blown up this, this uh, obesity and diabetes epidemic. And even right now, if you actually pull back the sugar from the population a bit and pull back some of the refined carb, you're not going to see everyone suddenly getting slimmer and healthy no. because they've already been programmed multiple generations to be sensitive. So now I think people, that's one reason you have to go quite low carb because going back to a high healthy carb diet may not quite hack it when you've already been damaged. So that's why if you've got 65% of adult Americans over 45 now in CDC figures are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Mm -hmm. two-thirds of the population over 45 is essentially diabetic 
if that's the case, the default diet for the population is going to be very low in carb, no refined carb, no sugars, no veg oils, just for starters, just to start getting a grip on this mess. Wow. It's scary. And I mean, actually, while I'm backing you up on this, you, this is why, again, ladies and gentlemen, fat, the fat emperor.com. Um, and the great thing is Ivers actually posted on his site. If you go to the fat emperor.com slash videos, or just click on videos on this toolbar, you've got a lot of your presentations. You hinted earlier in the show about the slides that you educate on, obviously PowerPoint slides, I'm guessing, but you've got, for example, uh, last year, uh, last year's presentation from October on here, um, at the an annual, what was that? The, Oh, the British association for cardiovascular prevention and rehabilitation conference here, September, 2017, you know, keto fest, 2017. And obviously I'm guessing there'll be a new entry coming up on here from, you were just in a few weeks ago in San Diego, weren't you? Yeah, actually, I have a lot of talks since then. I've just, you've reminded me to update this page. <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, so I There's went. my I was, subtle hint. <laughs> thank you, Scott, actually. Wow, I'm looking at that with some embarrassment. But um, no, that was a good talk in the British Cardiovascular Prevention Association because it's not easy to get into conferences that are not low carb, that mm. are purely medical. And I was happy with that one. But I spent the last two weeks in the States. I went to Montana for Ancestral Health Ooh. Symposium, spoke there. I got a flight to the East Coast and went to New London to Keto Fest, 18, spoke there. And then I went to San Diego for Low Carb USA San Diego and spoke there. And I also interviewed in Vegas on the same trip, the inventor of the calcium scanner. And I've just released that interview. And that's oh, a real- is that, uh, That's on your podcast, right? On my YouTube and, and blog yesterday, the latest entries, Okay, uh, you'll see Dr. Uh, or Professor Douglas P. Boyd, the inventor in 78 of the calcium scanner. An incredible That's exciting. Tool. Well, and obviously you hinted that earlier in the show here. And mm. real quick, just checking on your time, because I know we started earlier today. You're still good right now? I'm okay for a little okay. bit, yeah. All right. Well, I, I want to bring that up here. So you, all right. So you hinted at the power of calcium testing. I, I wanted to make sure we didn't breeze completely over that before the show went out. That I've heard that more and more as well. And like even even Anthony J told me he's like when he did my g- genetic analysis, he's like you know normally when I do these, I ask people to send me their their full blood panel testing too. Like he dig he prefers to dig into the DNA and all of your blood work as well. Now with calcium testing and this, this calcium tester, what's up with that? Is that an over-the-counter thing that we can accomplish? Do we have to go to see a professional? What's happening there? Well, in America, it's around $100 generally. It can be higher. Some states, you need a doctor to write you a script to get it, but most states, you can walk in. You okay. just find out the hospitals, clinics, scanning centers that give a CAC score, a calcium scan of the heart. All right. And it's a five minute test. You get your result straight away. And for middle age, middle risk people, it's hugely powerful because if you get a zero, it means it doesn't mean you're invincible, but a zero score means that you have a very low risk of a heart attack in the coming years. And oh, wow, you're going to go to those diagrams, are you? Well, I don't know. I'm if, just bringing up well, your video. If you flick forward a little at the start, you'll see some uh, slides I put in. Yeah. That's the scan. On the left, the green circle shows a guy at middle age. It's actually Dr. Gerber at 54. Really? Zero, zero calcium. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Jeffrey Gerber in the corner. That's legit. <laughs> that, yeah. I didn't realize that was there, but there you go. Um, so he's had two scans. He's a zero. So am I. It means you have around a 1% chance of a heart event in the coming 10 years. Hmm. Not zero. You still got to be careful to look at your bloods and watch your health but it means you are in great shape compared to most people. On the right, oh yeah, the right just showed... Um, there we go. Yeah, the right shows a guy with maybe a six or 700 score. You can see the white calcium built up in the coronary arteries. And that's an evolutionary defense mechanism. When your arteries are inflamed with atherosclerosis, what causes most heart attacks, your body will bring in bone matrix and actually create bone to stabilize the weak areas. That's what that is? That's calcium, and it's not, a, it's not a contamination. Your body brings in actual bone matrix formation processes to as a response to the injury. Get out of here. 
Yeah, it's amazing. And the beauty is this five minute scan can see it. So you can see the tip of the iceberg that shows how big an iceberg of soft plaque you have under the surface. That's crazy. So, uh, if you go to the next one, actually, this is really good because I this helps uh, me talk through it. So here you see an early plaque that's developing and early enough in the stage, there's a calcified shell. And sometimes there's micro breaches and the micro breach of the plaque, calcium will come in and repair. So it's quite early. So this so right here is like a micro yeah. breach? Okay. Could, well, could be micro breach, can be just the body sensing the inflammatory problem. Okay. If you, if you go on a little, you'll see you get real calcium a little later. Uh, there in the, in the left-hand circle is calcified plaque, and that shows up on the scan. So you know you're at this stage, that you're heading for trouble. And again, this is a blown up version of a cutaway of an actual blood vessel, right? This is what this yes. diagram is representing. So it's represent with time going to the right as you become more diseased. Wow. So the calcium scan for most people, not all, can catch your disease and tell you you got a problem before you have the heart attack and let give you a chance to take action. Now, the action you take, there's no point just taking some meds. It'll help. But what we are saying is you need to do all of what we were talking about earlier, Scott. Oh, all yeah. of the root causes, fix them all, and then monitor your bloods and get a follow-up scan later and verify, hey, I've slowed or stopped this progression. That just shows a zero around 1%, one and a half in this big study. All the studies say the same thing. And if you go on a tiny bit, you'll see that greater than a thousand, like David Bobbitt, mm -hmm. uh, my supporter, uh, you've got a massively higher risk. And this one, this one's a beauty. This was done by Professor Budoff, tracking 25,000 people. The zero guys, 12 years later, 99.4% were still alive up the top there. And the high scoring people down the bottom, only 76.9% were still alive. Wow. So it's the most prescient and incredible predictor of your future mortality that there is. It's not 100% perfect. Nothing is. But, no, but it's, yeah. this is a huge wake-up call. So, I mean, this is a great teaser. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm sharing from here, let me shrink this back down, is from his YouTube channel. Like, that's, we're literally on his YouTube channel. So, you can go and, I'll, again, I'll have all this linked in the show notes. But you can, just search, you can go on YouTube and just search for Ivor Cummins. But I will have everything hyperlinked like I always do. And you got over 15,000 subscribers. So, clearly people dig your feed. <laughs> well, so, it's all free and there's like thousands and thousands of hours of research, huge yeah. network support and thousands of scientific papers analyzed over six years to be well, able you, to kind of do this kind of stuff. And it's free. It's all well, free. And, and that, that's the beauty of this because, and this is the problem. This is the thing that I, I want to make sure before the show was out today. Like this is what you got to do people. I mean, he's got the network, he's got the data, but not everybody is putting it all out there. So it takes inf powerful influencers like Ivor to say, wait a minute, there is things like YouTube and podcasts and heck, even Facebook Live. So there's no excuse now. Let's at least put the content out there for people like myself and, and your other 15,000 followers that want to actually learn this information. So I love this. This is great. Great. And, Thanks, Scott. And, and this David guy's name was Professor Douglas Boyd, right? Yes, yes. He's the inventor of this incredible scan. Uh, they had CT scans back in the 70s, but they took 10, 20 seconds to scan, and he invented a high-speed electron beam that was so fast it could do a full scan in 50 milliseconds, one twentieth of a second. And because wow. your heart is bouncing around like, you know, a puppy in a sack or whatever, <laughs> I think I just made that one up. I don't know. That's fun. I like that one. <laughs> Yeah. Um, obviously, you need a super fast scan or the heart will move and blur the image. And this okay. guy, this guy developed it. Uh, it's an amazing technology. So, so real quick segue, because I got to ask this off of the last comment, right? We, you're showing us cutaways of the blood vessels. We're showing buildup of calcification, uh, you know, calcium. But, but Ivor, I was told that cholesterol is building up plaque in my blood vessels. So here's one thing I got to ask you. Is it wrong for me to try and, I've said this before on the show and I've never been able to ask anybody with your level of research. Is it weird for me to say, guys, cholesterol should be considered more like 
a lubricant or something like that, right? Like it's, it's like, no, it's just, there's no way cholesterol is triggering inflammation. Inflammation is triggered by the excess sugars and low carbs and infl- swelling of a blood vessel is inflammation triggered, right? That's the point. Yeah. So if you think of cholesterol, it's not really cholesterol. These are lipoproteins. So the right. LDL is low density lipoprotein, uh, which is a macromolecule like, like a sphere and okay. it contains cholesterol and triglyceride, but you have trillions, zillions of these in your blood. Now native undamaged healthy lipoproteins do their job. Evolution designed the system. It's incredible over millions of years. If you do things to damage the those lipoprotein particles to oxidize them, to make them stay a long time in the blood, being attacked by other components and maybe hyperglucose, and many, many more. If you smoke, you'll damage the lipoproteins. Sure. So there's myriad things you can do in your environment to damage the lipoproteins and kind of cause them to become part of the process, part of the cause. But for me as a purist, it's not the native evolutionary lipoproteins they're beautiful uh, that can really be called a cause it's what damages that system and the other thing is the lipoproteins partake in immune response so if you have infections you may have higher numbers of lipoproteins and that tends to connect the number of lipoproteins to the problem so they often also higher numbers if you are insulin resistant classically the biggest reason for having high numbers of cholesterol particles is insulin resistance syndrome or metabolic syndrome and that means that higher numbers are going to correlate with worse outcomes okay so there's loads of ways that the higher cholesterol can associate with bad outcomes and there's lots of ways that the lipoproteins can be damaged by real root causes in your environment and then become part of the cause. But the key thing is there's a huge difference between blaming evolutionary particles and acknowledging that they can be susceptible to become part of the process of atherosclerosis. Well, the good thing is you, you said the key word here that I was going to ask next was, was the particles. And uh, like there's a nurse that, co- that comes on Vinny's show uh, often called uh, by the name of Nicole Racine. And oh, she, the, yeah. She's, tra- she's trained in doing that particle test. So that is something that I know she insists on is that guys, like don't just do your traditional blood test with the, with the whole, um, you know, cholesterol analysis. Like you need to actually do a, an actual deep dive into a particle level test. So is that true? Uh, ideally, yes. I mean, they cost money. And um, if you use the ratios of the simpler, older test, they're pretty good. Uh, but a particle test will not just tell you, you know, the amount of cholesterol floating around. It will tell you the number of the particles and the size of them. And those things are very good to reflect insulin resistance issues and other problematic uh, causes. So the particle test is more accurate and it can help you reassure yourself if your standard cholesterol panel doesn't look great. Uh, the only thing about it is we're still not entirely sure when you have higher particle numbers, which is a substantial risk factor for heart disease. I think the million dollar question is, are they higher because you're fat based metabolism and you need more particles to transport or triglyceride as Dave uh, Feldman would say on Mm. cholesterolcode.com or are they higher because you have an underlying problem like metabolic syndrome and you really need to address it. And I think, the bottom line is if you change your diet and your particle numbers shoot up, um, you've got to really look closely and make sure there isn't a, an issue that's causing a high particle number. You okay. need to look at your insulin, your inflammatory markers, everything else. You don't ignore when your cholesterol jumps up. You look really close. Uh, I think that's important for people to realize because I'm a little worried nowadays. Some people are thinking, Oh, you know, cholesterol's complete junk, but cholesterol can be a sign that something else problematic may be going on under the hood. So it can be a good indicator. So you don't ignore it. Oh, it's definitely a, uh, yeah. a trigger, right? Um, I, I agree with your point. I mean, it, it's funny. So I donate blood every eight weeks. Um, I try and stay really on top of that. I, I call it an oil change, even though there's nothing being changed. But I tell people like, Hey, you know what? I drink bone, I drink bone marrow broth and everything else. My guys like just donate the blood because your bone marrow needs an excuse to work anyway. So why not 
drain it out and kick it into high gear again. I, I, it's a huge part of my, my, my standard health practices nowadays. So I, I love that, Scott. You're helping. I do the same. Well, I, I keep forgetting to, but I try to do it because it can also lower your iron loading in your blood, okay. uh, which is no harm and may be very beneficial. And the beauty is all of the things about giving blood, what you mentioned, lowering iron, many other things, it's all good for you, mm -hmm. but also you're helping other people. Yeah, you're giving so back. It's, it's like, oh, I, I know win-win is a cliche, but I think giving blood is the most beautiful. It's perfect win-win. Well, you'll appreciate this. Hold on. I'm actually overdue. I'm actually in my blood donor site right now. There's their little cholesterol. They, they give you, ladies and gentlemen, that's the other thing. When you donate blood, most places give you like a quick little free health test. They're going to give you oh. your blood pressure analysis, your, your average pulse rate. They're going to give you your temperature. But again, they're going to give you a very high level cholesterol analysis. They used to mail me this stuff. Now you just log into the site and get it. So, and that's it's funny because look, look at this. You could tell that, I mean, uh, since 2016, I think I've might have increased some of my healthy fats or, or, or healthy cholesterol in my diet. I, I guarantee you, I probably had a huge omelet that day. But <laughs> yeah. well, that's around mine. But of course, the the triglyceride and the HDL and the ratios between those are the key thing. But uh, right. still, it's free. You know, it's a yeah. freebie. That's why I tell people like at least at least dig into it and like this is this is better than nothing. Like that's better than nothing. I mean, if you had to start somewhere. And you and money is an issue. Go get a free like donate blood, save a life, and get a quick little snapshot of where your health is at. It's it's better than nothing. So absolutely, I agree totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I know you got a crazy schedule today. I am just excited that you and I have finally been able to connect. Uh, you've definitely been one of my my healthy influencers. I've been trying to get on because of all the great work you guys are doing. Again, ladies and gemmen, as I hinted before thefatemperor.com. And as usual, whenever I bring on healthy influencers like yourself, I'm going to have so much stuff. I got a link in the show notes now because <laughs> you got your, your YouTube channel. We've got the websites. We've got your influencer uh, videos. And actually, and usually we're about two weeks out on, on episodes. So I don't know how soon you'll be getting your video section of your site up to date, but will that be happening relatively oh, soon? I Tomorrow, by, by the end of the weekend. Yeah, it's pretty quick. I just forgot about it because I was so busy with everything else. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, and, and again, and this is something fun for you, ladies and gentlemen, we, we hinted at it earlier on the show. And so Ivor is a part of this exciting project right here. The Fat, a documentary project that we've, we're, we literally have raised over $180,000 to pay for this movie. While you were in San Diego, you were there with Vinny and you guys were actually doing some shooting. And the only reason why I know that is because Peter Pardini, the director, uh, just sent me some uh, images to update uh, for, for Vinny's social feed. And this is one of them. So you'll be, uh, oh, you'll, be getting, you'll, you'll be getting tagged online pretty soon since I've been helping with that campaign and some of the social media well, posts. So. Actually, excellent, Scott, because I knew that either Vinny took a photo or someone did of me and Dr. Gerber as we did our interview. I have those too. I have those too. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I was going to email him and, and get the photo, but I, I was too busy. But I'll wait. I'll wait till it comes out. Well, and again, little trick in marketing is let somebody else post stuff about you and then yeah. repost or reshare because it's more powerful because somebody else is talking about you. So, but yes, yeah. if you want the originals too, just let me know and I'll email them over. But everything is on my, uh, I have a master project uh, file system set up in my Google Drive. So I, everything is being dumped in there from this project. So uh, excellent. It's yeah, going to be I'm, a great movie. I'm and excited. The quality, we walked into that room, a hotel room, and the bed was open at size and the place was freaking crammed with equipment. Yeah. I mean, big studio HD cam cameras. I mean, you know, not, not the small things. It was packed. It was amazing. Yeah, I, I don't know how. It was funny because I didn't know where you guys were doing it until mm. they started sending me photos. And I'm like, is that a hotel room? <laughs> and I was like, dude, way to carpe TM, you know, seize the day. It's like, listen, there's a big low carb conference going on. All the big influencers are there. The hit list that Vinny wanted for his movie, or most of you guys were there and ladies. So it's like, boom, let's, let's rent a hotel room and convert it into a movie set. <laughs> And it, that's exactly it. It really was converted into to a proper movie set. It was actually, amazing. You'll, you'll appreciate this. This is from Vinny's uh, Instagram feed. There's one of the images. I think that's the bed. Is that the bed right here? Standing up that's on end? That's the bed standing. <laughs> that actually, 
<laughs> when I was there, it was much more crammed because where the guy is with the hat, there was a huge screen rammed in and scaffolding poles holding it up. Oh, yeah. So, this is, if you look at this cloth right here, I think that's, they haven't fully deployed it or they had already pulled it back down. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a backdrop behind your photographs, right? Well, there was kind of two of those. There was a backdrop and there was another. <laughs> oh, look, it was just a cram. The only place you could sit while I was waiting for Gerber and he was waiting for me was a little seat jammed against the door. <laughs> and that was it. Everything else. <laughs> it was really funny. But see, that's the exciting part about this. Like, mm. see, and I tell people all the time, like, that's the stuff people need to see. People need to see the action happening. Things are going on. There's people like yourselves, like cramming into a hotel room just to pull stuff like that off. Um, and like, you're going to see a lot more. Like, I don't know how active you are on Instagram, but everything that I post to Vinny's Instagram goes to his, his uh, Facebook feed too. So that way you guys are getting everything out there and just in case you're more active on one channel versus the other. Like this is one of the photos. I think this must've been taken at the keto conference, right? Yeah. The low, the low, the that, low carb, the low carb San Diego. That's it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think, no, that's San Diego. That's the hallway. Yeah. The keto in the background is a, is a yeah. stall with a vendor. Yeah. So there's other images with you. I just, I just, I, you know, they're going to be slowly cycled into his feed over the next week or two. So oh. just rotating them through. So don't worry, you'll be getting tagged more. <laughs> I'm not so vain, Scott. I, I, I know. that too. Are you? <laughs> well, and hey, Vinny's got a huge following. So yeah. the more people we can find in Vinny's world to find you and everything else, it's all about the power of cross pollination. So exactly, there's yeah. a kind of a war afoot, and we got to align with all the other forces. <laughs> yeah, well, and now with this movie, this is this is this is the fat war. Okay, <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, it's, it's on. So. Yeah. Well, I hinted at it before we started the show. Uh, you are the co-host today. So how would you want to close the message out for our listeners? We covered so much information. The show notes are definitely going to be detailed, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to want to follow him on his YouTube feed especially as well. But uh, you've been on a lot of podcasts as well. So is there anything, you like an all-encompassing message just to kind of leave behind for these people if they forget everything else we talked about today? Yeah, well, what I would say to people is, I have a few phrases, show, show me the data is one of them. You need to look at the data yourself. Um, and another one is, if you don't measure it, it don't get fixed. So you need to be measuring the right things and not fooled into this kind of cholesterol circle, which is a bit of a backwater. Uh, but the big thing is you need to take ownership for your own health. Uh, you can probably extend versus the average you know, ill American, you can extend your life by maybe five or 10 years. And you can make the last 30 or 40 years of your life way better quality of life. So it's not just living longer, it's living better, dynamic, mental acuity, feeling good. And you have to take ownership for it. So just like David Bobbitt trusted the system, never got a calcium scan at middle age, finds out he's completely diseased, finds out he's diabetic. They never caught that either. He took ownership, leadership for his own health. And just like you described, uh, uh, Scott, everyone has to do this if they want to take control of their destiny. And, and no one will do it for you. I mean, that's, the, that's probably the key thing. Your doctor's a great guy. He's trying to help. No one's going to do what I described for you. You have to do it for yourself. And your children and your grandchildren and history will thank you for it. You know, that's probably what I'd say. There we go. I love it. Well, hang tight. I'll give you a proper goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't have asked for a better way to close the show out. He just reinforced everything we talked about today, which is, again, I'll sum it up, like take accountability for your health. I mean, yes, you want to trust your medical professionals, but don't be afraid to question it. Do some of your own research, do your own analysis, because again, we all do want to live longer. But as Ivor just said today, I think you're going to want to live better along that timeline as well. So this has been an amazing, healthy, influential podcast show today. As I promised, ladies and gentlemen, you're here so we can fuel your health, business, and lifestyle with this podcast and everything else we do online. So thanks for tuning in to another powerfully healthy podcast episode. And remember, check out thefatemperor.com. Follow him everywhere. We'll have everything linked in the show notes. And again, we're here to fuel your health, business, and lifestyle. Thanks for listening into another powerful Live the Fuel podcast show. We'll talk to you guys again soon. You're free of the pod. I just leave the video on for extra fun. So, All right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit tight now, but I'll still make it. <laughs> All right, sir. How I was that? I mean, that, that flowed, I, I think. I told you, that's, it, it's a lot easier. We just, just let it happen naturally. <laughs> yeah, and I think people probably 
yeah, people listening enjoy that as well, rather than, okay, I'm listening to a kind of a Q&A. Yeah. They're, they're actually flying the wall. They're getting to listen into the conversation. Now you understand my format. So Yes, I think. And we covered so many powerful things today, so thank you. So Yeah, uh, even though we were just randomly bouncing, we didn't go away down a hole. We bounced around useful things. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and that's my responsibility as, as the host is to keep us back on track or you as well. Like we don't want to fully miss over something. We get it right back in and it works. So yeah. excellent, Scott. You're a pro. Right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, you enjoy the rest it, of your day, sir. Will do. And yourself too. And be careful with that old chainsaw. <laughs> oh, I'm safety first. Safety first. Take Good care. luck, Scott. Thanks. Bye now. Great right. stuff. How do you?